only zone trading is going on uh, uh, for streaming so 2 minute will start okay Ten seconds. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Am I audible, Amir? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So hello everybody and welcome back once again to this UPSOS webinar. Again, once again, the UPSOS is on air and we are very, very excited today, especially because this is an international webinar. We have two international speakers with us, one from Canada and one from Russia, and we are feeling so happy that we are connected with the whole world. Uh, so now we will start and I will request our chairman, scientific committee, Dr. Deepak Mishra, to introduce our international speakers and get started with the session. Okay, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to say you, our first speaker is uh, Professor Steve Asirno. He's from Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, Toronto. And second is Professor Boris. He is the Deputy Director General at SFI Microsurgery Institute, Moscow, Russia. Okay, so the, we start with the first talk. The first talk is by Dr. Steve Arshino, and it is on a topic which is of everybody's interest, intracameral moxifloxacin in cataract surgery. Okay, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Mishra, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, to be taking part. Can you see my screen yet? No. Now can you? Yes, we can yes. see. Okay. So uh, my topic is going to be preventing endophthalmitis with intracameral antibiotics. And I'm going to talk about my preferred choice, which is diluting intracameral Vigamox, which we use in uh, North America because only Vigamox here has been shown to be safe. I know we have multiple drugs in India that you use that are also safe, but not here. So I just showed you a brief video of how I inject it. One of the advantages of using a larger volume is that you can reposition the lens as you inflate the eye. These are my financial disclosures, but my real disclosures, um, uh, it's not working. Okay, my real disclosures are that I do mostly bilateral cataract surgery, which I think is helpful in the days of COVID, although we're not doing any yet. And that I really like using intracameral Vigamox. I was the first in the world to use it, and I've used it for over nine and a half thousand cases. So there are a number of things that we've shown to be effective in preventing endophthalmitis. The first is the 10% Bayadine scrub and 5% topical eye drops that we all use, except in Sweden where they use chlorhexidine. If you use chlorhexidine, you have to be careful to use the concentrations that they use, 0.5% for the facial prep, and the eye wash are 0.05%. If you use the hibitane that they use for stomach surgery and other general surgeries, you have a high risk of getting corneal necrosis. So don't use hibitane. We also know that tight wound closure is helpful. And since the ESCRS study and the preceding study from Montan in Sweden, we know that intracameral antibiotics are very helpful. But we don't know about the efficacy of topical antibiotics or about people who use uh, supplemental oral antibiotics preoperatively and at surgery. So I'm going to go through a few things and try to explain to you what I think is important in this whole field. So the first thing is that a lot of places use preoperative topical antibiotics for a few days. And there was a study done by Ong Tone from Saskatchewan a number of years ago, and now has been replicated by about six more studies, and showed that the only time you get a high enough concentration, which is shown in the red circle there, uh, is when you actually give the drops immediately preoperatively. When you give topical antibiotics for a few days preoperatively, what you do is you kill off the sensitive bacteria and you leave a rich environment for resistant bacteria, if they happen to be around the environment, to grow on the conjunctiva. So if anything, you might increase your infection rate by giving preoperative drops. If you give a lot of eye drops, let's say every 15 or 10 minutes, 
three or four times before surgery, you actually get a very high level in the eye and on the conjunctiva, and it sterilizes it quite effectively. So I was lucky. When we do cataract surgery, it really is risky. And I was fortunate last year at the ASCRS to be asked to give this presentation to pretend that I was a Top Gun pilot about why I want to use moxifloxacin. And I took advantage of the name Moxi to change the spelling a bit and say that you have to have courage to be a cataract surgeon. So where do we, where do we stand? Well, we know that intracound moxifloxacin is now probably the most commonly used antibiotic globally for this purpose. By September 2017, there were 26 studies which supported its use with over 7 million eyes. And now we've had the, the study from Dr. Hari Priya and her group. We probably have over 10 million eyes between hers and some other studies. Only two studies ever showed or didn't show conclusively that intracameral antibiotics were effective. Both of those two studies were done in Japan and both used too low a dose to be effective. So I have used my diluted solution uh, since 2004 and done nine and a half thousand cases. And I like this drug very much because it kills really everything that we're exposed to at the dose we use intracamerally. Initially, we had five drugs that were candidates for intracameral use. They were in three different classes and two of them dropped out because there was a better one in the same class. So we're now left with three and those three drugs sit in two groups. There are time dependent ones, which are generally less effective and I'll show you why. And there are concentration or dose dependent ones, which are considered more effective. So when you look at drugs, you have to first look and see if there's anything bad about them. So the first drug I used to use was vancomycin on the advice of Dr. Gimbel in 1992 or so. And what happened in Canada is in 2003, they began to give us only generic vancomycin and that drug preparation was known to cause TAS, so we didn't want to use it. So I then changed to moxifloxacin. But the big problem with vancomycin is it doesn't cover 5% of the gram negatives that we see, and that's probably important in India. And also the biggest thing in the West is it causes hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis. And I think that has really resulted in most people drifting away from vancomycin as a, a prophylactic agent. Next drug is cefiroxime, which you all know about from the ESCRS study. The problem with cefiroxime, well, there's two problems. The first problem is it allows enterococci uh, to grow because they're always resistant and they usually destroy the eye. The second problem is uh, that it's hard to dilute and there have been all kinds of problems with people making them in uh, sort of not so perfect pharmacies and getting uh, complications of dilution and uh, complications in surgery. So the third drug we're left with is moxifloxacin, which is interesting because it's dose dependent. And I'm gonna show you why that matters. The only thing that we ever saw as a complication was the syndrome of bilateral acute iris transillumination. That does not occur in cataract surgery. It only occurs if you inject a high concentration between the iris and a phacic lens. So we know that both cefuroxime and moxifloxacin in the dose we usually use are safe. There have been numerous papers showing that that doesn't cause any problems to the eye, and we're quite comfortable in using those two drugs in the doses that we like to use. But there are three problems with this whole field. The first is that you don't want to use a drug for prophylaxis when the drug that you're going to use to treat endophthalmitis is from the same family and has the same mechanism of action. So, if infection, infection occurs with intracameral vigamox, it's usually coagulase negative staph, but that responds very quickly to vancomycin and ceftazidime that we use to treat endophthalmitis because they're different classes with different actions of drugs. But if we get an infection when we use cefuroxime and we go treat it with very similar drugs, both of which act on cell wall synthesis, it tends not to be effective. And that's why enterococci when they recur as endophthalmitis, usually blind the patient's eye. Second problem is how we look at MICs. If we look at our two classes of drugs, the time-dependent ones, vancomycin and cefuroxime, they both have the same MIC90 of two micrograms per mil, and we inject them both in the same concentration. And we don't consider some things. We don't consider that gram negatives aren't affected by vancomycin or that enterococci are resistant to cefuroxime. 
And so we refer to those as non-covered bacteria. We don't refer to them as resistant of a strain that is often covered. Whereas when you look at moxifloxacin, because it kills everything, we take the few bacteria, which are usually coagulase negative staph, and we see that there have been some reported that have high resistance, and take the MIC90 of those worst cases. But in the dose we inject in the eye, we inject enough to kill everything. So it's much more effective than the other drugs. Some of the studies that have been reported, like the one from Sweden, where they've now looked at 640,000 or actually more now of cases where some have used cefuroxime and some moxifloxacin, they actually showed that the endophthalmitis rate was a bit lower when they used moxifloxacin, although not significantly so. But they got infections, as expected, with enterococci with a cefuroxime group. The thing they showed that was unfortunate was they claimed that they had more staph and streptococcus infections with moxifloxacin. But if you look, they used a low dose. If you use a low dose, it doesn't kill off the resistance strains of staph or streptococci. And the third issue is why we inject 0.1 cc. It's a practice we inherited from retina surgeons because they haven't got much space in the vitreous to inject a drug. And it's very difficult to give 0.1 cc exactly into the anterior chamber. If we dilute it, we can wash out the anterior chamber and we know more exactly how much we put in the eye. There was a paper recently by Shorstein et al. where they concluded that smaller injection volumes of a higher concentration of moxifloxacin resulted in less accuracy and less precision in the delivered dose. So it is better for us to inject higher volumes of lower dose. The study that really showed this to be conclusive was actually done in animals, where they did it in rabbits. And this study by Asen et al. was done to look at the, uh, the pharmacology and how the drug works in the eye. And they got very good curves for the vitreous concentration, for the aqueous concentration. But what they showed here was that when they took a sample from the anterior chamber 30 minutes after the injection in the rabbit, really only 1% of the antibiotic was left in the eye. And the reason is that when you inject a low concentration, it often leaks out. And they tried very hard not to have it leak out, but none of us go and sample our patients 30 minutes post-op. Montan studies showed that there was a drop in the anterior chamber concentration by fourfold in the first hour, probably for the same reason. So when you inject a low volume, you take a high risk of losing a lot of what you put in the eye. So I'm gonna talk about some studies that we've done to look at what actually happens to these drugs in your eye. And we made a mathematical model. And the reason for a mathematical model is that we can't go back and sample a live patient's eye every hour post-op. But we can do it and make a model and we can then test the model to see if one day or once in a while when we do sample, we get reasonable results. So uh, to create a model, you have to do a few things to be able to show it's valid. And the first thing is determine the volume of a newly pseudophagic anterior chamber. It's not 0.3, which is the usual volume of an anterior chamber, but it's, a point, it's the 0.3 plus the empty caps are back. I'm sure you've all observed at the end of surgery that the chamber is deeper and you have the space of the anterior chamber and the empty bag where you're injecting the drug. So it's actually 0.5 mils and not 0.3. And if you calculate the aqueous abatement using exponential decay, there's a mathematical formula for this, and you end up that the half-life is 2.89 hours. That's actually quite accurate because it's reported to be between 2 and 2.67 when calculated in fake guys with the difference being the anterior chamber volume. So if you do the math, it actually works out quite well. So we know that's accurate. The first curve we get is if we inject intracranial moxifloxacin into the eye, we see that it lasts. Now, what these lines are, this is a line showing the resistance level of the usual target methicillin-sensitive uh, staph aureus. This is the mutant prevention concentration, the level we want to achieve to know that we will kill all the bugs in the anterior chamber. And these are the two levels of the most resistant strains ever discovered in the world to be resistant to moxifloxacin. We can see with this dose, we still get seven hours of a level above the resistance of the most resistant strains ever shown. So we know that every bacteria we've ever seen in ophthalmitis is sensitive to this dose. So you then, we did another paper and we decided we wanted to look at all of the antibiotics. And this is more complicated because now we have time dependent and dose-dependent ones. The red line is the line 
for vancomycin and cefuroxime. We only have one line because I told you that the MIC90 is the same for both drugs and the amount we inject is the same. And the red lines are resistance levels to those two drugs and the blue lines are for moxifloxacin. And then these bumps in the graphs are adjustments for being time dependent or dose dependent drugs. So a time dependent drug, the resistance we have is the level we had in the eye a few hours before. But in a, in a dose dependent drug, the resistance we have is it lasts three hours longer than the drug stays in the eye because it binds to it. So we have to adjust these two curves. And we end up, if you look at these two points, this tells you basically how long the drug is effective in the eye. And we get about 20 hours for vancomycin and cefuroxine and about 40 hours for moxifloxacin. And these are the gaps between the drug level and the cytal level for the usual target bacteria. And you see it's twice as high for moxifloxacin than for vanco or cefuroxine. So then we want to look at and say, well, what happens if we give people topical drops or oral antibiotics? Because some places in the world still do that. And the first thing we did is plot, what happens if you decide to treat endophthalmitis with topical moxifloxacin given every hour to your patient? Well, we see that here's just the topical drops going in the eye. And by two hours, we're already above the mutant prevention concentration, which is quite good. And it stays at that level for as long as we keep giving the drops. It stays at about four times the mutant prevention concentration. Here's the first graph we had of what you get, the blue line, if you give it intracamerally. And if we give both, you see here that the line goes like this, and we have a better effect of giving the drops with the intracameral after about 15 hours, and that lasts really for about 24 hours. And then it just keeps staying at the level of the four times the NPC for as long as we give the drops. So drops probably have some effect, but they may only have it if you have a wound leak, because by 24 hours, you'd expect to kill all the bugs anyway. So you, by maintaining a longer yeah. dose, it would help you if the patient had a wound leak, but not otherwise. But no one really gives drops every hour. Yeah. So what happens if we give the drops for four times a day or six times a day? Well, here are the graphs of what happens if we just give the drops and no uh, intracameral dose, use intracameral by comparison. And you see we get up to about the mutant prevention concentration for the very sensitive bacteria, but not for the resistant ones. How about if we give both? Well, here you see the line where if we gave it with the every one hour, and here's if we give it every four, every six hours. So we get a level that's helpful, but really not that helpful. That's why we haven't been able to show the topical drops prevent endophthalmitis. It really only keeps at a level where you will kill the common uh, sensitive staph aureus, but not the resistant strains. So how about if we give oral? Well, oral is more complicated because we have a reservoir in our uh, systemic circulation. And so you have, you're leaking some into the eye the whole time. And here at surgery, the level drops at surgery because um, the eye is open. But if you gave it, let's say 12 hours before, orally in a second dose at surgery, by two hours, you already have a level that is above the immune prevention concentration of the usual bacteria. And it stays that way for about 20 hours or so. If you then go and you give the intracameral, it lasts longer because it goes to uh, 24 hours. And if you give both, it goes to about 30 hours. So is there any benefit of giving this drug orally? Well, perhaps, but I would imagine from this kind of a graph, the benefit really would only occur if the patient had a systemic infection. So you'd, you would prevent endogenous endophthalmitis, but you probably would not prevent something that came from surgery. So if you wanna look at this and see if it has any validity, you look at the literature and see if there are papers showing validity of these drugs. And in 2017, Libra and Matthews published a paper looking at endophthalmitis isolates from Bascom Palmer, and they found that only moxifloxin was effective against all the isolates. Vancomycin and cefuroxime were not active against pseudomonas. And they found that all of these drugs, even at low doses, kill streptococci. But to get rid of Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas, you had to use moxifloxacin at more than 0.5 milligrams. That's why the Swedish study had a higher incidence of Staphylococcal infections. They used too low a dose. The next study was done uh, in the British Journal of Ophthalmology and meta-analysis of all the data up till that time. And they found 
that the post-op endophthalmitis rates with cefuroxime was here, moxifloxacin is in here, and uh, vancomycin in here. These two drugs were found to be superior to cefuroxime, and, but they were not significantly different between the two of them. So moxifloxacin and vancomycin were equally effective, but the problem is that vancomycin can cause horror. So it leaves you with moxifloxacin as probably being the best drug we have. So how do you make it up? I know that you can buy it, and I'll show you how you can buy it in India, but in Canada, we can't. We have to use Vigamox, or you can use the Sandoz authorized generic. We put the whole bottle of Vigamox in a syringe. We add balanced salt, seven cc's, and we rotate it, and we can use this. And if you inject a bit of this on the tray for each patient, you have enough for 16 eyes from one bottle. So it's actually not expensive. Uh, you, Aprocam, you can get in Europe. I don't know if you can get it in India. Aprocam is pre-diluted pre cefuroxime. It's not single use, but it is pre-diluted. In India, you're lucky because you have the most available moxifloxacin, both Oramox, which they use at Aravind, and you have four quin uh, PFS, which comes in a syringe, which is very nice, but it has enough in it that you can use it for more than one case. It's supposed to be single use, but how people use it is up to each person. Now, in the US, there's been reluctance to use antibiotics. So I always wonder why when I go lecture there. So there were two studies last year that were interesting. One of them showed how much money you'd have to save per, per case to make it useful to do this in terms of saving money for the healthcare system. And it came out to be $20 per case. And then it said, well, is the use of the drug actually cost effective? And this was done by a pharmacist and this by ophthalmologist. And they said, if we can save $22 per case, it's worth doing it, even just looking at money and not the patient. So even from the American view of only money, it is a beneficial thing to do. But you see, in Canada, it doesn't cost us $22 per case. It costs us, well, it costs three per case if we did it diluted how we do it with American funds, but it actually costs us about one-tenth of that to buy it in Canada. So it costs us about you know, 30 cents, 50 cents per case to do this. So it's really quite cheap and it's extremely effective. So the brief summary of all this is that moxifloxin appears to be the safest and the most effective intracameral drug we have for post-op endophthalmitis prevention. At least 0.5 milligrams of moxifloxin should be injected uh, so you have enough to exchange the anterior chamber. And it's better if you use it diluted because that way you know how much you have in the eye all the time. And topical and oral supplemental moxifloxin don't make much difference in the usual cases. It might matter if you give topical, if the patient has a, a wound leak in the first 24 hours, and oral might be effective if the patient has endogenous pathogens. My final thing is to quote Huey Lewis, that if a new drug comes out, I'll gladly change. But for now, I think our, our safest drug is moxifloxacin. Very nice. Don't make your eyes too low. Okay, thank you very much. Ooh, that, that was a wonderful presentation. Very informative. Dr. Steve, thank you so much for this. Thank you. And we will take the questions at the end. So now we go on to the next presentation, which is on telemedicine, which I will be doing. Yeah, is my screen visible to everybody? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. yes. So, Dr. Mehta Sharma, as you all know, is our secretary and she's doing a wonderful job and uh, making UPSOS proud and really international uh, society today. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, and uh, so today I'm talking about telemedicine, which is the need of the R. Now, in these times where we have a pandemic, we have a lockdown, and social distancing, just distancing is the only way uh, to solve this situ situation, uh, to, uh, to take care of corona. Uh, telemedicine becomes the need of the hour because this is protective, not just for the patients, but also for the uh, 
doctors as well as the healthcare workers as per government orders we are allowed to see most of our hospitals and clinics are open but we are allowed to see only emergency patients so telemedicine becomes the only option for patients who want elective consultations now once the lockdown is lifted uh, it does not mean that the corona is over even when the lockdown is lifted as the movement starts the risk increases even more and that there is a risk that it may increase exponentially especially if we do not continue to practice the physical distancing hence even when the lockdown is over telemedicine will be a very useful option uh, even uh, our government has taken active and keen interest in this and uh, uh, recently the arogya setu uh, app was launched and on the call of the prime minister within 2 days 20 million people downloaded this app now not just for the disasters and pandemics uh, telemedicine is an option for later also because once these pandemics are over still there are situations where telemedicine may be needed one is that it gives a very timely access so if somebody has a has a problem for which they need an urgent attend, urgent uh, consultation they can use telemedicine secondly if you are in an area which is inaccessible which may be a rural area or it may be that you are in the hills or somewhere where the doctor is not available there also telemedicine can be a useful tool and thirdly uh, for, it is a, it is useful because it can uh, save your travel cost time and effort so even when we are off lockdown and we are off uh, the time where corona is almost gone or it is very less then also telemedicine would be needed hence this is something which we all should adopt as soon as possible now if we see the scope of telemedicine uh, we can see that our indian medical medical council had already approved of telemedicine in 2002 and recently on 25th march 2020 niti ayog gave some guidelines and based on these guidelines telemedicine can be practiced now this can be practiced as per niti ayog by any registered medical practitioner there are going to be online programs which government will soon launch uh, but this but they have given an interim period of 3 years for 3 years you can continue to do telemedicine and but within these 3 years once the programs are launched then you are supposed to uh, do these online programs and learn how to do it better now there are certain exclusions for telemedicine one is uh, you cannot do research and evaluation with telemedicine secondly you cannot be doing continu continuing medical education for health care workers and thirdly you cannot do it for international patients there are various modes of communication there can be a video mode an audio mode or a text mode and there can be several tools for telemedicine telemedicine can be a simple call which a patient does if the doctor is available on the phone and the patient has the doctor's phone it can be with the help of social media such as whatsapp skype zoom facebook etc messenger etc and even on mail but the best way is to do is with is to do telemedicine is with a dedicated telemedicine app because that this has got several features and you can do telemedicine as per the guidelines if you are using a proper app the purpose of these consultations can be either emergency consultations in emergency consultations the doctor can give the first aid measures and then refer for in person consultation and it can be for non emergency or elective consultations where it may be a new patient it may be a follow up or it may be a follow up patient the good thing about telemedicine is that all important people can be involved together which means the patient the caregiver the healthcare worker and the rmp all are together in fact there are apps which can get the patient as well patient sitting on one side and the caregiver even if the caregiver is not in the same house maybe sitting in another country both of them could can be coming together for a telemedicine consultation for example there is a mother whose son is in say london then both of them can be coming together so that they can take decisions together uh one word of caution is that on telemedicine we should only prescribe safe medicines so uh, medicines like anti cancer drugs or, or related to immunology immunology should not be prescribed and as far as ophthalmology is concerned we should avoid using steroids and cyclophlegics ethics and privacy has to be maintained uh, but the rmp is not responsible if there is a breach which is caused by technology so we should too choose a technology where ethics and privacy can be maintained for sure 
So as I said, there are so many tools for telemedicine and it is very, uh, very difficult to decide as to which tool we should use, but a dedicated app is the best. For last one month, we have been researching on various types of uh, solutions for telemedicine. And I will, uh, again, uh, in the last webinar, I had given some tips for what a good telemedicine app should be. And I'm sure you all went down, some of you went down went, uh, and uh, checked on different kinds of apps. I'll just quickly revise on what a good app should be, and then I will show you a, de a demo of an app. First of all, it should be a personalized app. We are promoting a personalized app and not online platforms that are where there are multiple doctors, so that if the patient looks for a doctor and does not find a doctor, then goes to the next, and if the next is not available, then goes to the third. Because in these telemedicines, you are also sharing your data. So you want that there should be no, first of all, competition that is in, that is in the mind of many. And secondly, we are discouraging rating of a doctor. Because if a doctor is rated, then this means that the patient is rating not just the doctor's competence, he's also rating on how the front desk behaved, how much was the waiting time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the telemedicine app should have a feedback uh, module where the patient can give a feedback so that only you know what the feedback should be and uh, what the feedback is and you can improve accordingly. Secondly, it should be very easy to do. So the biggest hitch in everybody's mind is that it is very complicated. That this is what we have been hearing from, from many people. But you have to choose an app which is easy and simple for you to do and for the patient to do. Thirdly, a uh, very important privacy and patient confidentiality has to be maintained. Consent has to be taken. Uh, previous, it should have the facility of uploading the pre previous records as well as linking it to your uh, MR. All modes of communication should be possible, audio as well as video. Appointment scheduling should be possible. Emergency, there should be an option for both emergency and scheduled appointments. There should be an op option to consult multiple doctors in a, in a single, um, because there may be multiple doctors in a single hospital or a single practice. There should be an option of notifications, call reminders, automated messages. There should be an option where family can also join in. Uh, the patient, uh, you should be able to upload pres prescriptions. There should be an option of monitoring the progression, that is monitoring the disease, so that patient becomes involved in the monitoring of the disease. And you should be able to research as to how your treatment is benefiting your different patients. There are apps which have all this. And there should be a payment gateway in which it is your decision whether you want to give it free or you want to charge fully or you want to wave off or you want to charge more. So you have to find an ideal solution. Now, uh, I want you to again go back and try looking for an ideal solution. And, uh, and these are some of the highlights. Once you start doing telemedicine, this is what you should do. Your communication should be clear and it should be as close to in-person consultation as possible. You should be formal while you are consulting. You should not be, you should not use any language which is informal. You should ideally have the previous records of, uh, of your follow-up patients. You should avoid any possible delays because this again um, disturbs the patient. No proxy consultation should be allowed except for minors and for incapacitated. No anonymous calls should be allowed and no teleconsultations for medical legal cases. And you should be able to give a detailed relevant prescription and uh, if you want, you, there should be a facility to extend the duration of the call. Normally, a telemedicine call is for around 10 minutes. Now, I'll just go through, take you through a small walkthrough of the app that we are using. Now, whenever a patient contacts us, we can add the patient here. Now, we add the patient by giving a small Google, a small, a Google form goes to the patient and the patient can fill it up or our person can fill up the, the details of the patient. All these details are not necessary. What is necessary is just the name and the gender of the patient and we get started. Now, as soon as, uh, as, soon as we register the patient, there is a username and a password which comes and a, and a message goes to the uh, phone of the patient where this username and password is given to the patient. Now, once this message goes, the patient can, can go to the Google Play and he can uh, download the app. Now, once he downloads the app, on the left side is what the app looks like on his phone. He can take an appointment, which can be either a scheduled appointment or it can be an emergency appointment. So, so the doctor will schedule the appointment as per their availability in the app. Then the patient has an option of a video call or a, an audio call. So he can choose. And on the right side, as you can see, the doctor has scheduled the appointments 
has scheduled the timings when they are available so that the patient can choose. Now, once the patient chooses, patient gets a confirmation that uh, their video call is booked and they get a message five minutes in advance that they need to be ready now. Now, this is on the doctor's laptop that they will get, uh, they will get a, a list of their appointments. And uh, when the call reminder goes, then the patient uh, makes a video call. And this is how the telemedicine video, call, video calling happens. Now, at the end of the call, there is an option for payment, which the doctor can decide on. Uh, and then there, and, and, a, and an invoice can be generated. Now, uh, apart from this, from your own data, like we had a data of around 50,000 patients available, we registered all these patients on our own. This the IT person from the app will do it so that uh, so that if it's not a new patient, an old patient, they can actually be already registered there and already a message has gone to them for, uh, with their username and their password so that they can download the app. Now, this is on the laptop of the doctor that the appointment scheduling is uh, visible. And, uh, and this is how the doctor can actually schedule their appointments as per their availability. Then this also has, apart from appointment configuration, a drug master, an investigation master, a payment master. So finally, what is the best telemedicine app? Best telemedicine app is the one which gives qualitatively, quantitatively, and revenue wise, which uh, the best, uh, what becomes the best option for you. And it helps you to evolve into a better clinic even post lockdown. So, what is important is that the doctors wrote only clinical consultations, rest of the things should be done by the technology. In fact, technology is doing everything. So, as, as I said, what the patient or caregiver cannot do, that only technology should do. What technology can, cannot do, that only front office can do. Your front office is almost free. Their job is only not scheduling appointments, but only, only push, giving push messages. And only what all these cannot do, the doctor should do, which means the doc, that the doctor should only give consultations. Thank you so Thank much. You. So for, you can choose, as I said, you can choose your own app, but you want any help from us we have been researching for our last one month you can you can contact us thank you so much very nice very well done dr Mohita. thank you so much sir so uh, now we go on to the next topic by uh, dr malujin and this is on ITIS update again a very very important topic for everybody Dr. Boris, as you all know, is a very, very famous yeah. eye surgeon and uh, he has been doing, he's, he has become famous because of the Malugian ring and he is the deputy director. We have visited his center and it's a wonderful center and all of us can go to Moscow and see the kind of working they have in their center. So, Professor Malugian would be speaking on IFIS and uh, I am so much thankful that he accepted my request and uh, joined us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very much honored to be today with you and I thank Kamaljeet and uh, uh, Dr. Mishra and Dr. Mahita for inviting me to join this uh, web uh, seminar. And of course, I will be happy to share with you uh, uh, my experience with uh, um, uh, with intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, and to give you the update on on that uh, uh, on that uh, uh, topic. So uh, this is the typical picture that uh, may everybody may see here. This is the pupil, which is moderately dilated, but we can also see that the iris incarcerated into the main wound and to the paracentesis. And this is uh, what, what you expect to have uh, uh, in that case, uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, which was described uh, almost 15 years ago by Campbell and Chang. And uh, this is a typical triad of sy syndromes, uh, warping of the iris, so billowing, uh, um, propensity of the iris to prolapse through the same main and uh, um, side port incisions, and progressive pupillary constricting uh, during the surgery. So this is a very, very typical triad, which happened to many before 2005. However, in, uh, it was described uh, nicely 
by uh, the, this uh, great team. And you see here is at the beginning of the case. Uh, the pupil is not very small. Uh, however, the uh, this is the Indian and uh, at the same time Russian cataracts, which is not infrequent in, in 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 my clinic. And we see that as soon as viscoelastic uh, was aspirated, uh, the pupil starts to constrict, and it goes into the side port incision. The iris is incarcerated. And this uh, makes uh, the situation quite uh, challenging. And of course, you need to stop and do something uh, because it's not um, a good idea to continue the surgery as it is. So it's uh, now uh, injection of uh, OVD uh, being done. And we see that after that, the pupil uh, is relatively uh, small, uh, about 3.5 millimeters to 4 millimeters in diameter. So we know that the reason for the intraoperative uh, for the iris syndrome is actually thinning of the muscle uh, dilating uh, the iris. This is a, uh, a healthy subject and we see that the thickness of this uh, uh, muscle is much uh, higher than in the control subject who was intaking uh, tamsulosin. And this is a post-mortem study of the irises of the patients affected um, you know, uh, patient intaking tamsulosin and uh, potentially uh, they are uh, will be affected by the IP syndrome. And in this initial series, uh, we know that the uh, there is a high complications rate uh, going up to 12.5 percent 12, 12 uh, overall. And some of these uh, are quite devastating with the partial. Um, a loss of iris tissue causing not only functional uh, and but also cosmetic um, issues for the for this patient. So the uh, uh, there is a tendency uh, for the male patients to have uh, be in the more risky group uh, as opposed to the female patients. However, uh, the the difference is uh, uh, not. Uh, as significant as it, as many of you may uh, consider um, um, uh, to 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 have. So that means that uh, IFIS is uh, um, it's more predominantly go um, uh, happens in men, 57% in that study versus almost 43%. However, uh, not uh, necessarily can be observed only in men uh, having. Um, uh, uh, been in prostate hyperplasia. And overall, a uh, number of cases as shown here in this series was about 12.6%, which, uh, which is quite high. Uh, what about uh, female patients? Um, uh, most of them are having uh, arterial hypertension and anxiety disorders, drugs that uh, apart from uh, the uh, tamsulosin and that group of um, medications will increase the risk of uh, uh, the IRS syndrome. So the question, the other question is, uh, is intraoperative floppy IRS syndrome can only happen in person taking medication? And the answer is no. Uh, you see here that only 26% out of this group of more than 100 patients were actually uh, um, using medications. Um, and these are the, the groups of uh, uh, pharmacological substances they were uh, using. So meaning that uh, uh, by uh, only uh, asking uh, patients preoperatively about medications uh, will help you to a certain extent, but not, uh, not completely eliminate uh, the risk of having IGs. So whether we can predict IFRS, this is another important question. And as shown here in, in this group of patients, uh, the, uh, the, the patients that are having initially uh, smaller uh, pupil, uh, dilated pupil preoperatively, having um, um, a much higher um, uh, incidence of grade three intraoperative floppy iris syndrome which, which was uh, almost fourfold higher in the, in the other uh, group that were having uh, well uh, dilated uh, pupils. 
So that means that by judging the pupil preoperatively, we can actually anticipate whether or not the patient from the risk group will have or will not have uh, intraoperative iris syndrome. So how about uh, prevention and treatment? And uh, my preferred uh, method of uh, preventing the intraoperative floppy iris syndrome is injection of intracameral mediatics. There are several uh, mediatics that are available now, um, uh, including uh, those that are commercially available, Mydrain, which is a combination of phenylephrine, tropicamide, and lidocaine. However, you can um, uh, make in, uh, in the OR, uh, there are reports of uh, using the other uh, uh, drugs such as, such as phenylephrine, uh, combined with lidocaine and also epinephrine, and this is another type of uh, medication, which is a combination of non-steroidal drugs and phenylephrine that can be added to the uh, irrigation solution. And it actually does not help you very much to expand the pupil, but it helps you to uh, to uh, contain the pupil size throughout the surgical procedure. So this, this is how the uh, intracameral phenylephrine works, and we, we see very well how the pupil starts to expand immediately after, uh, after um, um, injection of intracameral solution. Uh, however, we know that uh, this is uh, uh, not a magic drug, and in, in, such, an, in such as in that case, we, we, with the tube exfoliation syndrome and uh, cataract, you see that the pupil starts to open, but to a certain extent, uh, it stopped. And uh, obviously, we will need something to, to do more in, in, in that patient. So there are some technical uh, recommendations uh, for, uh, dialing, uh, for, for dealing with these patients, uh, uh, decreasing fluidic parameters, adjusting the, uh, the the fluidic parameters of the back of machine, working at the very center of the anterior chamber, using several um, nuclear disassembly techniques, such as Saker chop, which is my favorite, and by manual irrigation aspiration, all these technical, um, uh, um, uh, all these techniques will help you to uh, avoid uh, iris damage. And also, it's very important when the pupil starts to constrict, you don't have to use pupil stretching maneuvers, which is it's, uh, absolutely contraindicated in intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, uh, because it will give you um, additional um, uh, trauma uh, to the iris. So this is uh, the patient um, uh, with the uh, um, lens, um, uh, pretty fragmented, uh, in advance with the femtosecond lasers, and you see the lines of the laser. And again, as, as shown here, uh, during the course of the procedure, uh, we see that the pupil start to uh, constrict, and uh, we are uh, now dealing with a smaller and smaller uh, pupil. And uh, basically, uh, it is accepted uh, to generally accepted uh, for the experienced surgeon to deal with the pupil, which is. Uh, about uh, four millimeter in diameter. However, anything smaller than that will cause additional uh, issues and even inexperienced hand um, may uh, provide uh, some uh, issues such as uh, iris aspiration or iris trauma uh, to, the, uh, uh, to that uh, patient. Uh, iris hooks are uh, uh, the uh, useful devices that can uh, and should be utilized in, in intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. You have to be careful not to overextend the pupil, otherwise you lift the uh, iris above the plane of the anterior capsule. And also, uh, it is, was uh, recommended by Thomas Oeking from Iowa. Uh, diamond configuration of uh, iris hooks position is uh, quite helpful when uh, one of the hooks is located uh, below the main uh, cataract incision as shown here. So it prevents uh, the trauma to the, uh, to the iris when you are going in and out with the instrument uh, through the main incision. So if you're uh, considering uh, using uh, iris hooks, think about diamond configuration. Uh, 
Uh, there are several devices that may help you as well, such as that one, uh, which uh, which is uh, uh, the pupil expansion ring, as shown here. It helps you to expand the pupil and hold it in eight uh, points, uh, which gives you a very nice round pupil, uh, as opposed to the square shape of the device, uh, which you may anticipate uh, they give you the square pupil, uh, which is uh, not the case. And with that modeling of the uh, intraoperative uh, float the iris syndrome uh, that was done by uh, by the group of uh, uh, British um, um, engineers, we actually uh, showed uh, that there is a lifting power um, that goes uh, from from the um, uh, from the irrigation currents and lift and uh, allows the iris to below and prolapse, as you will show in a couple of seconds. You will see in a couple of seconds uh, how the iris uh, behaves under the uh, irrigation currents, and this is the mechanism of buckling and or billowing uh, the iris. However, if you have uh, the the uh, pupil expansion ring in place, in that case, uh, Malugin ring, so there is still a little bit of billowing you can see here, however, it is not very significant uh, because of the um, uh, of the points of fixation uh, that hold the iris in place and uh, that actually prevents uh, the uh, floppy iris syndrome. So, uh, as a result of this study, it was concluded that um, um, uh, the iris buckling or billowing can arise at lower pressure when the iris stiffness is reduced which is actually the intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. And there is a clinical relevance of using uh, pupil expansion rings, such as Maluin ring, to prevent that uh, condition because it mechanically stiffens the iris uh, and uh, um, apart from giving you uh, dilation. So this is uh, another typical case of uh, floppy iris syndrome. And you see that the a patient is having pupil very nicely dilated, but watch at the paracentesis. Here, as soon as this scholastic left the anterior chamber, we see that uh, nothing is holding the iris in place, and the the uh, the iris starts to um, uh, prolapse. It starts to billow, and uh, there is a prog very progressive constriction of the uh, of that pupil. And of course, in in that case, we need to uh, to stabilize the iris with iris hooks or with the uh, pupil expansion ring, as it is in, in, in that case. And you see, after injection of this elastic again, the pupil is uh, not uh, um, so small. Uh, that's why, in these cases, I do like to use uh, the bigger ring, which is seven millimeter, because it allows me to hold the iris. Uh, in a moderately dilated pupil, which is not uh, infrequent in uh, floppy iris syndrome uh, cases. And as soon as the IOL goes into the uh, capsular bag uh, and the ring is removed, we see there is a little bit of um, um, uh, uh, transillumination, uh, loss of pigment um, due to the incarceration of the iris into the paracentesis, however, it's not a big issue. The other advantage of uh, using the pupil expansion ring is actually uh, you can um, decrease the operating time as shown here. Uh, there is a significant uh, um, in, uh, increase of uh, operating times in, in, in patients uh, that are using iris hooks. Uh, both can be observed in trainees and the uh, consultants or experienced surgeon. But as you can see here, by utilizing the pupil expansion ring, you're actually being able to reduce the uh, surgical time uh, quite significantly. And um, in iris hooks cases, the surgery took on average 10 minutes longer than in pupil expansion rings uh, and 18 minutes longer in trainees cases. So that's uh, that's a very significant uh, uh, conclusion from that study. And I have to mention there are different uh, pupil expansion devices. Some of them made in India. 
uh, some of them are made by international companies. So you have uh, different options uh, to choose from. And this is the newest version of the Malugin ring, which is a uh, Malugin ring 2.0, which is thinner, having 5.0 polypropylene, new injector, new holding, and uh, two sizes, uh, pretty much similar to the classical version, six and a quarter and seven uh, millimeters. So this is uh, again for the Iris syndrome, uh, the uh, case of intraoperative uh, op uh, floppy syndrome after attempt a second laser assisted cataract surgery. And I will uh, show you um, uh, that at some point when the people become very small, uh, the surgeon decided to stop and inject the pupil expansion ring, even in spite uh, of the fact that the uh, 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 that the uh, lens was almost removed and there was only cortical material. However, it was considered to be uh, safer to to uh, to keep uh, the uh, the pupil expanded uh, while evacuating the cortical material uh, because of um, uh, uh, this is an important step. Um, of, um, of that um, uh, of the surgical procedure. And now uh, the ring is removed. And this is the 7.0 uh, uh, millimeter ring, which is uh, having a slightly bigger size and uh, very much adapted to the floppy iris syndrome. And also uh, it's thin uh, and quite elastic uh, and does not cause any damage to the uh, uh, to the iris. So I do like to use it in um, uh, in most of my uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome patients. And this is the surgical armamentarium we all have uh, for, for this uh, kind of complicated cataract surgery. So my take home message is, so be prepared because ISIS happens. Check patient history for medications. However, we know that it's not, uh, necessarily that it happens in patients having some kind of medications. Uh, it's good to use preoperative atropine because it also decreases the chance of uh, floppy iris. Intracameral mediatics are very helpful. Uh, we need to lower vacuum and aspiration settings. And of course, if all these uh, measures uh, does not provide you full success, you need to use pupil expansion ring. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mandujan. This was a wonderful presentation, very important points that you told us and very important take home messages. Almost all of us have been using the Mandujan ring. And wow. so almost all of us were also waiting to hear you on this topic. So we'll take the questions towards the end. And now we go on to Dr. Kamaljeet Singh. He will talk on why I prefer a manual capsulorexis. Now, doc, it is said that this corona is not just having a health impact, but a huge psychological and an economic impact. And with this economic impact, with almost no money to buy Femto or Zepto, this seems like a very, very relevant topic, which everybody would like to hear. I'm not getting my screen. Dr. Maligian is there. Yes, yes. Yes. No, it's coming. So, friends, uh, it's a very, very important topic because, as Dr. Moita has already said, uh, the cost of the rexes should not increase because normally we do around say 100 cases and still out of them only 20 cases are fake emulsification rest of them are manual small incision cataract surgery so that is the problem and we don't have one femto or zepto and i know that uh, all uh, eye surgeons are so much accomplished that they can easily perform 90 to 95 percent uh, capsule rexes with the help of a needle or a utrata forceps. So here I am just showing you how this um, femto-assisted capsular axis is done and that is the only advantage. And uh, so on the left side, you can see this is being done and uh, 
on the right side you see the manual capsule rex is being done so the only problem occurs in those cases where you have a wide cataract or subluxated cataract where there, there is a little bit of advantage of uh, femto assisted capsular rexis but normally in a wide cataract you can make a spiral rexis or you can aspirate the cortical matter easily and then do uh, rexis so i normally do with forceps so you can see it, i'm doing a spiral rexis in this wide cataract and can be easily performed without any problem This is the Zepto model. This is a nano laser, as you all know, and it needs a disposable tip, costs around 10,000 bucks for each case, which we all know that we cannot afford. Our patients need to be done in very, very cheap uh, cost so that you are able to perform the Capsular rexis on the other end, you see it's also done in the same way as I have already shown you that a spiral rexis is very good for hyper mature cataracts or mature cataracts. And these kinds of cataracts are very common in India. And uh, we all are used to doing capsular rexis easily in these cases, just with the methyl cellulose. So viscoelastic is usually uh, used and you can perform the surgery. So 95% of the cases we can perform easily the rexis. So what I always say is that for making a circle in the anterior capsule, why do you need to buy a three crore rupees uh, instrument that is femto and 15 lakhs uh, zepto instrument. So there may not be any need for that. So manual capsule rexis was started by Gimbal and Newhan in 1991. And this led to a revolution and FICO emulsification was started. People say that there is a little uh, significant learning curve which causes problem and uh, you need to learn it. So normally I do with forceps because it's very easy to perform the uh, rexis with forceps. With needle you might take just 40-50 uh, cases of uh, cataract surgery and you'll be master of that. So it's not that uh, uh, long learning curve that you have in manual capsular rexis. It's a strong rexis, very, very strong rexis, the manual capsular rexis. Whereas this uh, femtosecond laser came, all the proponent of uh, femtosecond laser, they say that uh, multifocals need a, a centered circular rexis and uh, it should be uh, overlapping the IUL optic edge. So that is required. So in 100% of the cases, uh, you have to do a femtosecond laser so that you can implant a multifocal lens or toric lens. But what I say is that in 95%, if you can get a good rexis with manual uh, technique, what is the need? If supposing you fail in some cases, there is no problem. You can convert to a monofocal lens also. So it's just for the 5% or 2% cases that you need femtosecond laser. And they say that it's dimensionally superior capsulotomy. But the problem with this is that it makes a mini, mini can opener uh, openings into the anterior capsule. And the drawback is that, the, as I have already told, there is capital equipment cost and maintenance is very costly. Procedural time increases because you have to do in two steps the surgery. And uh, so you take longer time. It's a weaker capsulotomy, they say, that uh, there is increase in the incidence of anterior capsule tears compared with manual because it always remains round and therefore it remains strong. So that is there. Now, Zepto laser is also there. It's a quick and consistently shaped and sized capsulotomy. So it remains round all around and uh, all the 360 degrees of the uh, capsular excess are created and simultaneously so there are no small openings into that and it's the strongest they say with, when the uh, studies have compared the zepto with manual and uh, femto they have found that this is the strongest but it's still it is costly and each uh, capsulotomy cost you additional 10,000 bucks so that is there so it's a it makes a smooth intact defect free capsule the undersurface becomes very strong and therefore it, it is considered good. It makes a, the size that you want, you can do it. Uh, 
I'll skip this. Now, many a times it happens that uh, in corneal opacities and uh, when you have a Argentinian flag sign, you, the, for prevention of that, you do femto. But here I would show you how to do the rexis if you have got a Argentinian flag sign with the one hour's uh, scissors, you give two cuts and then you proceed with your uh, rexis from both the sides. You can convert it to small incision cataract surgery or you can perform fecal emulsification, bringing the lens in the DA chamber. So that can be done easily. And uh, that is what you can do in case in 5% cases that I am saying that you might fail. You can use this when there is a pterygium. Then also, when there is corneal opacity or pterygium, the femtosecond laser fails. The zepto laser can work still, even if the pupil is small. In small pupil also, the femto fails. And if you are master of this uh, manual capsular rexis, you can perform rexis in any case. So it's very easy to perform and uh, it does not cause many pro problem. Many a times we use indoor emulator to see if the central corneal opacity is there and you can perform a, a round capsular axis with the help of endo illuminator, which is put at the limbus. Then we have, uh, supposing you need to extend it further, which is not feasible in femto, so what you do is that if you have done a rexis, you have made a good rexis and you want to enlarge it, supposing you are doing a small incision cataract surgery, then you can simply cut it wherever you want. You can give a nick and you can enlarge the rexis without any problem. So that can also be achieved in manual capsular rexis. And In case you have made a small rexis, they say that many a times you are not able to make a desired size of capsular rexis. So I'll just show you how to do this. Uh, supposing you have done a small rexis, you make a nick there and then you extend it. It is not essential that in all cases you make absolutely round. It should be continuous. That is more important. It remains very strong and you can perform this. You can give many more cuts to make it round without any problem and you can make it round. So you can give a small, small nicks and in case you want to enlarge the size and you are doing uh, this uh, uh, SICS so you want to make it bigger in hard cataracts. So the problem here is that uh, already there is down economy with the corona there, the economy is going down and you never know that you will be able to recover the investment that you have done in FAMTO or ZEMTO, ZEPTO. And uh, what about the insurance, whether the additional charges these uh, companies will give you, that is also not clear. And uh, if the cost becomes too much, there is uh, that restricts the patient's access and it becomes a problem. And uh, Many a times we have to think whether the technology is really better and cost effective for our patients. And uh, does it give you a marketing advantage? Yes, some people say that when we say that we are doing femto second surgery, it gives you a marketing advantage. You get many more cases, but I don't think so. If you do a cheaper version, high volume surgeons you are, will get enough money to sustain yourself. And uh, does it undermine efficiency? I don't think, and you all ag will agree that it does not undermine your efficiency. And if you can make a good circle in the anterior capsule, you'll be able to do the surgery. Uh, Professor Aliu has compared all techniques, and he also says that I don't do uh, laser assisted cataract surgery now. He said that visual acuity results are similar in all the cases. So there is not too much need of doing uh, femto laser. If you cannot purchase, then it's finer. And if even if you, I think Aliu can easily purchase a femto. So even if he says that there are no improvement in the vision at such. Our prime minister also 
keeps on telling us to reduce the cost of the surgery and based on that i would say that we must keep on thinking of methods and techniques to reduce the cost of the surgery so that we our patients go uh, and have their food easily thank you so much one thing with pinch of salt it's economic not the cheap you are doing wonderful job but economic version is there not the cheap nahi nahi cheap does not mean that it is <laughs> cheap gives a different message does not mean that it's cheap it's economic version yes. so it's uh, all heads of the you very cost effective the yeah, better version will be cost effective not yes, uh, cheaper version so not a cheaper version economic yeah. version so okay. it's a quality version it's yeah. a quality version that's very good very good okay thank you so much thank you everyone so uh, the last speaker we have is uh, girjesh where is our chairman dr moita yeah now we will invite <laughs> i was muted by mistake yeah. sorry about that so we will now invite uh, dr girjesh kane uh, to talk about emr again there are several solutions for emr and it's always a dilemma as to what solution to choose girjesh has extensively researched on various solutions and he will again take, take us uh, uh on a walk through to what a good solution should be thank you ma'am uh thank you ma'am okay okay i have searched a lot of uh, emr software now that I, i chooses for the uh, health graph software for me so basically the emr for the best solution the present and future emr uh, now the future emr the are the web based mobile open interoperable connected to the patient it is it's easily available why we do need a emr software for that today's practice we need to increase clinical and operation efficiency and productivity increase revenue improve patient care reduce opportunity to error improve the access information reduce administration and clinical cost competitive advantage and others these are the main features we need for uh, an emr and what services uh, we can connect to this emr we can connect the pharmacy laboratory even a radiology specialist a different consultants like retinal surgeon glaucoma surgeon and ot hospital and practice management even your uh, central store is also connected how can you use them these are very uh, easy to use uh, there is a very difficult to understand but they are very helpful for us Uh, we can use on our personal like computer laptop even a pen drive and printers and uh, it is very uh, easy to use how soon you can use them uh, immediately after you if you started your own setup uh, as a new new setup started then you can use it from first day if you have already having your own hospital and then it will take at least 3 to 6 month to uh, organize the things and implemented the all record and all the uh, things are to be submitted so that it will take at least 3 to 6 month to start the uh, new emr software there are some also disadvantage uh, for the paper record the paper uh, today uh, we are in uh, the era where uh, the, the all the things are in a digitally way so the paper the disadvantage the large number of paper are required No, lots of people are required to fill that all uh, problems and handwriting is problems and there are a lot of problems for that uh, paper part now comes to the advantage of uh, emr the uh, it is a very fast uh, record of here and great coordination and data has no data loss is there it provide alert to the doctor health needed relevant improve decision in the part of clinician help attack to prior medical history and collaboration between patient and doctor i'll show you uh, my emr which I, i am using in my hospital it is a web based emr uh, this is the main screen which i have uh, on my emr software and I, i'll show the uh, brief demo for that uh, software so we can easily understand these are the four patient uh, you can see easily see that uh, there are all four patient not arrived for one patient total my uh, appointment is four the patient name is ajay singh he is marked by uh, some uh, marking was there so he need a special attention for this 
so these are the time ke the patient waiting time is there and this is the criteria whether the new patient follow up patient doctor review or paid or free so we can easily identify whether the patient is free or patient is paid on this screen the appointment detail is there the patient photograph is there we can put a patient id over there for that surgical patient and all this thing and this is the name and this is the unique id which is needed for the nabh purpose uh, for every patient we need a uh, specific id now i'll just show you the how we can uh, collect the data from that patient it is a routine uh, Uh, thing uh, which which we can fill over the every patient. This is a name, age, sex, and this. The important thing is we there there is an option of patient type. Whether this is a package, whether this is a TPA patient or whatever the patient you can fill over there. And this is the address, occupational history. Even you can take a patient uh, Aadhaar detail and medical record for that purpose only. And one most uh, important thing is whether the patient was referred for by. some patient some other attender some doctors or some staff referral these are the category for that uh, referral if the, the, they are referred by doctor then we can choose a name of the doctor and we can fill over there and for that other side of the screen there, there is a time of appointment and date and whether which doctor you want to appoint if, if you in if in your hospital you have a four or five doctor so you can make on this on that level and the appointment type whether this is a review doctor review post op yeah investigation and yeah. what the category whether it is a free paid or uh, whether a camp patient this is another screen which uh, you can put a photograph over there and uh, all the details over there and then the history part is there whether there are diabetes hai whether there is a diabetes hypertensive how the duration is there and all this detail is there. this is the allergy section whether the patient is having allergic or something like that so yeah. you can get all the information over here now the patient come to the you and uh, you have to examine that patient so this is the examination sheet which uh, will open after coming to the patient over uh, to you and this is the history part and you can uh, also uh, put a vital signs and all these things and this is the refraction sheet it will hardly take one or two minute to fill that entire software over the single patient uh this is an un unedited vision pinhole glasses contact lens and this is intraocular pressure auto refractive dry refraction refraction dilated people glasses prescription and even post mediatic test keratometry and contrast and color vision everything for that refraction you just fill it here come the examination segment if we uh, see the patient is having a cataract of a grade 2 and cortical type of 2 if you want to put a diagram you just uh, draw this diagram over there so uh, it is not uh, difficult to uh, recognize them and similarly the if you want to put a fundus finding finding like the vitreous what is in vitreous and at at the fundus photograph is also the feature is there it can directly connected to your entire uh, instruments like oct like autoref like a scan so whether you can find all the detail directly transfer to the your software so here come the diagnosis part investigation part sorry so if the patient is having a cataract and uh, you just advise the uh, a scan so uh, whether it is perform or perform you can directly connect your a scan with this software directly all the data will be uploaded over the software and here the laboratory investigation whether you want to hiv hsp rs random blood sugar whatever the investigation you want you can uh, put over there and there is the radiological investigations here come the diagnosis so the patient is having a cataract cataract it is a cortical cataract and uh, it is a whether right eye left eye bilateral or you just see this is the icd coding over there this is the icd coding which is uh, very much required for a nabh and all this purpose so you just made a diagnosis over there whether there is a custom made diagnosis or whether it is the provisional diagnosis or fast to final diagnosis yes come the advice whatever the medicine you want to advise in a taper of taper form or a direct form you can advise over there you just feed this medicine sets over there so you don't require to fill every time that become of eye drop 12 times a day or duration for 4 days and something like that 
and whenever you advise a procedure you just advise a micro fico with foldable iol implantation bilateral whatever the procedure comment user comment whatever the comment you want to put that patient it will be over there if you want to refer then there is a referral segment also and whatever the advice if you want to advise ki whether the put uh, eye drop or whether the what are the precautions should be taken over their patient so it is over there it is in uh, four or five languages over there so you can put on a hindi and english and whatever language you want you can put it it now i'll show you a summary or uh, i'll show you a case sheet of that patient ki what exactly this patient uh, patient will uh, get from prescription part so this is the prescription part this is a complete prescription part i'll show you in a hindi language so it's a printable format patient will get this kind of prescription this is the space for your hospital name and logo and this is the name age and this mobile number and this is patient unique id this is the history examination it's a diagnosis along with this icd code or this uh, what in ophthalmic investigation you advise is laboratory investigation it's a drop ki whether you uh, give a drop or uh, along with a tape form and this is the follow up appointment and this is the instruction given to be this is along your sign one thing is very important if you want to give a only a patient a medicine print so you just give the medicine prints you don't want to give a investigation you don't want to give the examination and laboratory in one what you advise if you don't want to give you can give directly to the medicine slip and this will transfer to the directly your pharmacy also so here comes to the store this is the pharmacy store so when you prescribe the medicine it will directly transfer over your pharmacy it's come over here you just convert is and just select that medicine quantity it will the billing format over there so you not no need to extra uh, software for that pharmacy and similarly for the optical shop the patient with uh, if we if you prescribe the glasses it will directly come over the software so uh, the optician will give directly to the uh, pharmacy uh, optical prescription also here is a central store is also there this is a very good thing when you are uh, not able to monitoring ke uh, how the goods will coming and how we, how the, they they are consume or this so when whenever you purchase a goods for ot you just put it over central store issue to the concerned ot in charge and uh, opd in charge so that the, there should be a transparency over the goods whether there is uh, any mis misuse of this goods and all this thing now the patient comes to the ipd so we if we just advise a cataract surgery and we just admit it can summarize doctor ye uh, have you seen sir sir this is the consent uh, this this the admission consent and uh, it is already feeded over there if you want to change if you want to change your uh, consent pro forma so you can easily change over there okay, whatever you consent is for operative consents if we come to the operative consent is the retinal detachment consent we we just go for uh, just to go for cataract consent this somewhere this is the rop consent if you want to print in hindi or if you want to print in english whatever language you want to print you can print over there and this is the uh, admission form this is the admission form ki patient for uh, what the reason for that admission what the management what the clinical data what the diagnosis over there what the history was there so uh, similarly like assessment care plan ward checklist pre anesthetic check plus ot checklist sedation charge operative and even the post operative here the alter score is also there the patient alter score should be a major over there and this is the discharge Doctor. what the procedure is this discharge detail is there advice on discharge what the drug you have advised what the follow up is this and the pain or the all all this notes are available over here okay girjesh okay. sorry to interrupt you but we are behind time so have you have to go on for the discussion uh, so if you have in two lines something important to say you can say and summarize right right ma'am right, right. 
basically basically the use of emr emr software is that ki you just announce your practice ki from where which place you are getting a patient which type of patient is there which person is referred refer to you to just statically analysis or your patient is there that is the advantage so that you can consult over this thing so uh, it is better to use a software rather than uh, paperwork Thank this you. is the card which which we are using uh, just for uh, for safety purpose if the patient uh, if the uh, staff is not aware for that software so this is the card where all the things are filled so thank okay, you thank you so much girish and if anybody needs any other information they can contact you directly girish very nice talk topic. by girish he has yes. given a wonderful talk and i have learned so much from this talk yes. he is working in uh, muradabad and he is contactable to everybody So, so i myself are taking i'm taking tips for changing my emr uh, according to what he suggested mm. thank so, you Tim. thank you so now we will go on to the discussion so we have uh, our esteemed panelists with us plus we have some questions with the which have been uh, put up by the uh, by the audience so first question is for uh, dr steve what is the risk of tas with intracameral moxi and does it prevent Uh, propionium acne and there have been no reported cases of tas with intracameral moxi okay. and i showed you with the dose that we inject it kills everything okay it kills everything so okay so sir the second question is do you recommend stromal hydration to be combined with intracameral moxifloxacin it's an additional step you can do it but the problem with it is that the amount that you're going to inject intrastromally is very hard to be accurate. And so if you take your syringe of moxifloxacin instead of needing let's say 0.4 or 0.5 cc of what I use, you might need to have a whole milliliter. And then you inject some, you don't know how much you got intrastromally. But there have been some reports that show that it stays for longer. I don't think we need it longer than 40 hours anyway. Um but it's another alternative way of doing it. I think it's easier to give intracameral. Okay, so according to you it's best avoided to do a from a um, high. You can do it if you want, but it doesn't add much. But we can if we want. Okay, then the third question is can, can excess volume of moxifloxacin be harmful for the for the patient side? You can't put in excess if you dilute it because you're basically exchanging the whole anterior chamber. Mm -hmm. So you you really can't yeah, put too much in. But if you use it from the bottle If you use it from the bottle and you inject too much, you can put in an amount uh, that might be toxic to the cell cells. But there haven't, although some people have injected too much, there haven't been reports of damage publicly. So theoretically, you could put in too much if you take it into the bottle. But no one has shown any damage from doing that. No one has shown any damage from doing that. Ye beech mein kuch kuch karna. Because your thing is creating some disturbances. Okay. Uh, Moita, can I ask one question for Mr. Yeah, sir, sir, interactive session. Uh, I saw you, Dr. Steve, uh, doing bilateral simultaneous uh, cataract surgery, and uh, I attended your instruction course in the year 1998. Since then, I am also doing bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery. So, although it's off the question, but since you are uh, the authority on BSCS. could you guide us a little bit in 2 minutes about the bilateral simultaneous cataract surgery uh sure uh, i can tell you i've done a, a about 11 and a half thousand cases um in the beginning you have restrictions that you're afraid to do uh like unstable diabetics and people with bad corneas and this and that but as you do more and more of them you realize that if you can do anybody's cataract you can do that person's cataract bilaterally with appropriate precautions Uh, fortunately i live in an affluent country and i use uh, expensive obds and i adjust my flow rates so they're low to avoid damaging the cornea we change all of our instruments and everything else so nothing goes from one eye to the other and i do 90% of my cases bilaterally i make sure i use intracameral moxifloxacin for every single case uh and i've had no infections doing this and basically the patients uh, are very happy and see great the next day If you want to use multifocal lenses for example the patients adapt to them much better if you do bilateral surgery than unilateral surgery 
because they, they get the effect of summation right away and they see better than with just one eye with the multifocal. I'm not a great fan of multifocals because they do uh, impair contrast, but if you're gonna do them, so I, I, I actually, to be blunt, I reserve them for patients that are adamant and not very smart. So if you're a doctor or a lawyer, I will try to convince you not to get them because you will have a hard time working and for long hours reading and doing things requiring you to see well. But if you only want to go to the opera and read a menu in a restaurant and basically you no know, walk around, they're okay. But those patients do much better if you put both eyes together. You see, can I ask you, you one use two, yeah. two sets of can instruments you for? Uh, you use two sets of instruments for e the two eyes. Everything is, Everything is it's like two different people. It's a hundred percent separate. And now I do them, a lot of them with femtos. Another advantage of being in a more affluent country is now about half my cases are femtos. Um, and we used to do femto, then phaco, then femto, then phaco for the same person, bringing them back and forth. But one day Denise just gave a 75-year-old lady too much anesthetic. And when she got up to walk back to the femto, she fell over. So I, I mean, she didn't get hurt. But I, I sort of started to laugh. I realized that, you know, the risk of getting a bilateral infection or a bilateral problem is like one in a million. But the risk of her breaking her hip if she falls is much higher. So now I do femto, femto, feco, feco. They're the only case in which I will do both eyes, one after the other, uh, which is really contraindicated in most cases of bilateral cataract surgery. If they just want feco without a femto, I'll do one eye completely and then the other eye. But if they want to do femtos, I'll do femto for one eye, femto for the other eye, and then phaco for both. But I must tell you that after you've done femtos for a while, the complication rate is extremely low. You have to adapt some things, like they tell you to use large capsulorexes. Well, you shouldn't use large capsulorexes because if you do, your capsulorexes is bigger than 4.7 and you ever break a capsule, you can't capture the optic of the lens in the capsulorexes. So I use 4.6 to 4.7 capsulorexes. I also make sure that I always use the femto to break up the nucleus. Um, and so when I do that, the cases are actually quite easy. The only part that has any challenge is the IA because at the edge of the rexus, the capsule and the cortex can be stuck to each other a little bit. So you learn to deepen the chamber and put the IA under the cortex and aspirate instead of at the edge, like you do for most phacos, to sort of halfway into the bag. You grab it there and pull it out. And then you it falls out. You make a smaller excess uh, even in diabetic or retinal cases? I make it 4.6 to 4.7 for everybody. And that's not a problem in seeing ret diabetic retinas. It's perfectly fine. Okay. And if you clean the capsule well, you don't get shrinkage of the edge of the rexus, and so you see perfectly well. And no incidence of phimosis in these cases? No, not not four point. If you do like three point five, you know, like not, five, not four point two. Okay. In summary, if we have to do a bilateral case, we should uh, we should be talking uh, guy as a as a starting on a new day, a fresh case, and not just sharing anything. Wait, a one three question, one three question. In cases, how we do a lot of intravitreal injection? Any guidance? Because the recommendation is there, the bifidofloxacin should be given four days consecutively. Yeah, then only you should give the intravitreal injection. Any idea from you, Steve? We can get. I didn't hear exactly. As as intravitreal injection is concerned. The recommendation is that moxifloxacin for minimum four days is mandatory before giving any intravitreal injections for any retinal pathology. I am a vitreal retinal surgeon. That's why the question is important for me, in fact, to know from the experts. Um, to be honest, I don't think it makes any difference. Okay. I, you know, I get from my retinal surgeons, they often send me patients that have complicated retinal problems, needing injections, vitrectomies, and whatever. They send it to me because I will do bilateral surgery, nobody else will, and I'll do both their eyes so they can go back and have their retinal procedure the following week. Okay. And so I gradually come to do basically anybody that I can do PECOs on. I do a lot of people that have IFIS. I often do five or six of them in a row, both eyes. But I do it differently from what Boris said. Sorry, Boris. I don't use any lens. I don't like putting anything extra in the eye. I use OVDs and I dilate them 
before surgery with a combination of phenylephrine and xylocaine, and I stretch the pupils. Because if you stretch the pupil, and you then put a dispersive OVD in the angle, and then a very cohesive viscoadaptive in the center, bridging the center of the pupil, you can do surgery with a flow rate of 15 in a very tiny space, and nothing moves. And you, don't, you think nothing happened to the patient, the iris is totally stationary at eight millimeters and just sits there while you do the case. And then afterwards you take out the OBDs and then it flops around. Um, nice. But you can do that quite easily and then you can do both eyes and it's not a problem. And I don't like putting in extra devices in people's eye. And in actuality, when you use the OBDs, it takes you less time. People have complained about the cost of buying, let's say, Viscode and Helon 5, but I think the cost of buying Viscode and Helon 5 is less than the cost of buying rings. So <laughs> you know, you take your choice. It's going to cost you something. And also, fortunately, I do live in a fairly affluent country. And if I, I do some, a lot of patients privately, which is strange because it's not really common in Canada, but if I tell them it costs $100 more, most of them don't care because nobody else will do their bilateral surgery for their IFIS and whatever, and I'll do it. And they say, well, it's better than coming back for five more visits. Can so, we ask the comments from Melugian on this comment by Dr. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Is Melugian there? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, uh, I try to play with different disc elastic and I do, uh, I do, of course, know the uh, ultimate top shell technique that was described by Steve, okay. and in, in this case, it was well published. So at least in my hands, uh, viscoelastics, uh, like viscoadaptive, uh, super cohesive, they, they do not stay quite long. Uh, and I was not being able to maintain them for, for the whole procedure. So they either should be re-injected um, a couple of times during the surgery to, to keep the pupil expanded, or um, you you can have another strategy. So it's uh, different in in, uh, in my hands. However, I cannot disregard using viscoelastic. Uh, my personal preference, I think, is the 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 intracameral mediatic agent like phenylephrine. So this is a very important uh, for these patients. I think this is the best prophylactic of IFIS, uh that you can do. Uh, and then, and then after that, so uh, my preference is the mechanical pupil dilation. The scholastic is not working. Okay. I agree with okay. the ferrofrin and the dryasis. If you try to use a Helon 5 with visco, you put the visco first in the angle, and then you put the Helon 5 in the center, but you just put it to keep the visco in the angle. But your the network is not working. So that you can uh, work under it. It's not working. Oh. And can so, you hear me? Dr. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. So if you do that and you work in a small space with a flow rate of 15, the Vista OBD stays there for the entire operation. So, That's Dr. Dr. Melugin, uh, you wanted to say anything on this? I, I think I already commented. So, I, I, what, what is to be mentioned here is when you're using uh, very cohesive viscoelastic. Uh, what you have to worry about is uh, uh, it, the uh, take your needle that is clogged by uh, heavy viscoelastic. So yes, you, you have to be careful of not doing, uh, uh, of not um, um, starting with the ultrasound from the very beginning. So you need to wash out a little bit of visco and be sure that uh, it's not clogged. So I. Uh, other than that, I, I think that's, uh, that's possible. Okay. So now there was one more question for you, Dr. Malugin. Uh, is, uh, when we are implanting the Malugin ring, is there a difference in the technique if we do it uh, after the rexus or if we do it below the, uh, before the rexus? Is there a difference um, in the yeah, yeah. Actually, it's a, it's a big difference because if you do it after the rexus, you can easily catch the capsulorexus edge. Mm -hmm. And which happens uh, in in many cases, um, although you can uh, make some um, precautionary maneuvers, such as uh, injecting viscoelastic behind the uh, iris to separate it from the anterior capsule, uh, which I always do in in in, in when I inject the ring after uh, capsulorexis. However, 
it is not a guarantee that you will not catch the um, uh, catch the racist edge. So the next step for me is to move the ring to the left and to the right, and to see if it moves freely. Because it, if it moves freely in the anterior chamber, then uh, it's most probably uh, does not catching the absorption. If it's stuck at one direction, in one meridian, this is where you have to watch carefully and look at this point. Uh, and then if, if that happens, you disengage the ring and engage it once again. Um, so, other than that, uh, there is a technique. Your thing is creating a lot of uh, disturbance. Disturbance. Yeah. Sorry, there's a little bit of sound disturbance. Like I, I, I'm not sure I, I can hear you. <laughs> So what we understood was that it should be done before the rexis, but if it is done after the rexis, we should uh, inject uh, visco to the iris, or we should move this, and simultaneously we can move to the right and left, so that we are sure that it has not caught this cause the rexis. That's it, Correct. sir? Correct. Okay. So now, uh, next is a question to me uh, about telemedicine. Somebody wants to know as to what are the patients where we can use it, and is it relevant for ophthalmology? My answer is it is very useful for our follow-up patients, any patients of red eye, any patients um, uh, who, uh, who, who have any lid, lid pathology, and any other patient also where at least we can do a first consultation, remove the panic from the patient's mind, and if needed, then we can call the patient for, uh, uh, for in-clinic consultation. And the second question is they want to know about the app. For this, you can contact me directly. My number is 95. Six zero double eight nine four nine five. Okay. Then there is a question uh, uh, for Dr. Madhu Badoria. Yeah. Madam, you are working in a uh, setup which is a which has a lot of charity cases. It is a high volume setup. So do you, do you routinely use intracameral moxifloxacin? And especially like we had that Irwin study, Dr. Harpriya talks about it, where they, they have used in all cases and they have said that it's, there's a higher incidence of endo in SICS cases. And there's a higher incidence compared to other places. You see, we do about 30,000 cases annually and we use moxifloxacin each and every patient irrespective of paid or charity. And definitely it has reduced the incidence rate. We are using the single vial, the Oromox. And we're using for last three years only. Before that, it wasn't available. We were using directed Vigamox. But when I compared the data of in last 10 years, the first five years and the next four years that we're using uh, boxyfoxin, the significant reduction in the rate of endothelmitis, both in SICS and also in PECOs. Only code word is that in SICS, people don't, use, don't close the section properly. The side port is left leaky, and that is the cause for endothelmitis and not exactly the moxifloxacin. So therefore, my advice to anybody is that in SICS, the top wound is very well done, is covered, but it's the side port, which is the menace, which lots of people do not hydrate properly. And truly speaking, one can hydrate the side port and then put moxifloxacin so that there is no mixing or the amount is not diluted or this thing. You can deliver the exact amount of concentration that is required inside. And we use um, not 600, but 500 microns per patient. Okay, so you <laughs> We recommend. Thank Dr. Badir, I ask you, uh, how much does it cost you to use intracameral moxifloxacin in India? Per case. I think it's very cheap. It's not even a dollar. It's less than that. Maybe like one vial in less than a dollar. Uh, Dr. Madhu, I am using both and toad uh, moxifloxacin and uh, oro moxifloxacin in India. They are very cheap and very good. And one uh, ampule can be used in many patients. So it comes out to be very cheap. And uh, I am doing uh, without putting any antibiotic also in most of the cases. So I'm not using single, I'm using only single dose. Not even giving a subconjunctival injection, no intra, uh, intracameral moxifloxacin. And just I sprinkle a little bit of uh, gentamicin on top of the, after the surgery has been finished. Only thing is that I cover the conjunctiva properly after making a small incision tunnel. So that should be covered. It heals in 24 hours and uh, the chances of infection are reduced. So I fear so gentamicin I, like for anything. Last 10 years, yeah. uh, yes, yeah, for the last 10 years. Yes, gentamicin is endotoxic. 
it's very toxic sir i fear yeah, it like anything so toxic and there is a likelihood of ingress Maybe of intermycin fluid. on top of the conjunctiva sir don't worry any ingress of fluid is post operative fail yeah you yeah. wanted to use 50 rupees while you wanted to use in umpteen number of patients why this is soft yes in softer rise it can actually go inside so therefore uh, we refrain from uh, that but intracavitary hey, moxifloxacin is 100% delivery it, inside it, the eye so therefore yeah. there is no question of patient I, compliance I'm you that i don't use any other antibiotic just put the right. dexamethasone right. and, and, and i use moxifloxacin in number of patients in many cases because in uh fecal emulsification my residents they keep on giving me moxifloxacin <laughs> uh, so i am against it i simply put pre operatively <laughs> some antibiotic drops and uh, most of my cases the results are equally good or equally bad okay can i ask uh, can i ask madhu ma'am yes ma'am ma do you do you also do uh, bilateral simultaneous cataract surgeries we don't at least i don't i i had a very bad experience when i was a very young surgeon that i would say about 30 years ago i saw a case of a very renowned doctor mollist i was a resident both eyes done both eyes had terrible fungal lambda solmitis seeing that patient with shrunken eyes and a not so old man that some kind of a fear is gone inside me i'm telling you it's not an evidence based fear it is some kind of a psychological issue but truly except for children sometimes when they are very small say 6 months 4 month old babies those are different okay. cases other than that adults sorry i may do at a weeks thing at three days two doctor, days later uh, but i'm not going to do the same way doctor nilima i have done in uh, 20 cases yes, of all pediatric cataracts those who were very young uh, yes, cases yes, it is still a very very controversial topic and dr ashnov is a proponent of bilateral simultaneous cataracts i think in children it is here in india the ots are not that well sterilized so one yes. should stay from them. in children it is more risky No, it is because of the anesthesia. Okay, yes, because of the GA, you have six yeah. month old ch children. So there, you have to do. You can do it easily without. In because India, second time and giving anesthesia GA is slightly difficult. So my criteria would be a very poor risk patient for anesthesia who cannot really come again. And in those patients, we take precautions hundred times more than anybody else. and touch wood like uh, it's not that every case would go like that but if there is a rare possibility we we go ahead with it yes it's a highly controversial topic yes but uh, moxifloxacin as we are discussing for the simultaneous you can close it the patient you saw 30 years ago have cataracts and you're talking have totally separate sets of instruments and precautions taken yes you know yes, there was a study was, in england so I, i i was the resident I know, but the, 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 since you have such a high volume surgery, you yes. can actually uh, find out what your instrument and what your is, and especially since now you are using intracameral moxie also. Exactly. And plus, the part of urban study will be very beneficial, and then we can all be probably motivated into uh, bilateral surgeries also with separate set of instruments. I'm scared of bilateral, but that study we can take. But I think I think we can go into that. Any car accident. One question to Dr. Kilima. Two visits for two procedures is at least four or five times higher than the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you know, is it, you want to have a blind patient or a dead patient? <laughs> yes. But have a live patient and not blind as well. In in Europe uh, recently, and because you know, it's now discussion how to reopen. uh the yes. surgery after the covid we are not talking a little uh, too much today about the uh, covid pandemic and uh one of the uh things that we should do is to decrease the number of uh, times the patient is visiting the clinic so it might be a good idea to think about bilateral cataract yes. surgery not only in the economical aspect but also as a a uh, tool that uh, allows our patients to reduce the number of visits to the clinic and to to reduce the number of contacts in between and in between the patient and the doctor so if you do it in one shot and then you release the patient so there is a much less risk of contam contamination and so far and so forth so it could be another use of that of that surgery apart from we traditionally discuss uh, 
uh, within this context. Uh, Dr. Uh, Malibu, I'll hear, here. I'll beg to refer a little bit. In our country, the <laughs> environment, the air is not very clean. <laughs> Therefore, at, and lots of people, at least 70% Indians are living in rural area. Our pollution levels are much higher than your countries. So mm -hmm. therefore, it's not only the OT inside. The patient will come from an environment and will go back to the same environment. How much can we actually modify the environment? So therefore, uh, for India, I feel all those who are sitting here would, would, be, would be probably agreeing with me that it's almost a question mark right now in this state. Maybe post-COVID environment is cleaner, we may be better off. But COVID has made the environment cleaner. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So post-COVID is maybe possible, but right now it's very dirty. We used to talk about bilateral cataract surgery in one of our webinars, and then probably we will feel more motivated, especially because yeah. it is post-COVID era. And this may be a this may be a relevant point which Dr. Um, Malugin just put in. So then we can once we hear his presentation, then we can decide on uh, whether. We yeah. feel motivated or not. As he said, it's better to have a blind patient than to but have a. Uh, I am motivated in pediatric cataracts. And the only thing is, you have to see a blind patient. Yes. The patient goes blind because of a cataract surgery. The blame comes on us. The dead patient is not because he falls. That's not directly related. Yeah, patients to cannot complain. If you're careful, you won't get blind patients. So, one last question to uh, Dr. Nilima. You are in a medical college, so cost is not an issue. So if you had a choice between manual, Zepto and Femto, what would you decide on? Um, I would go for um, manual capsulorexis, as Dr. Kamaljit sir has been saying, because it works well uh, in our hands and most of us. And uh, with Femtorexis, uh, the, the problem of the tears is always there, the micro mini can opener sort of a thing is there. And the cost issues, of course, very, very high. Uh, only in those patients who have uh, hypermature cataracts, there is this issue of the Argentinian flag sign. And um, as uh, Sir showed, the concentrically increasing is really good. Uh, I use my uh, cohesive, the soft shell technique in the anterior chamber, and that is what most of our residents are doing also and learning in the training. So manual capsulorexis, as uh, Kamaljit sir says, I think it goes a long way. Thank you so much. And I have one more, to, Moita, one question. I want to thank Dr. Malugan because I'm a, actually essentially a glaucoma person. So I have loads of those uh -huh. small pupils and ACG eyes where your is extremely useful. So that is my big thank you to you for the ring that you've made. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to our international speakers, Dr. Steve, as well as Dr. Boris. It was a real pleasure to have you, and many people have learned a lot from you. And thank you to our speakers from UP, as well as uh, to our esteemed faculty for such an interactive session. And last but not the least, most important, thank you to Entrod and their team. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so much. Very well organized, yeah. Michael, very thank well you. conducted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, to UPSOS executives, yep. all the executives who are performing so well. Thank you, thank you sir. So thank you, ma'am. And thank you, you for having me there. Thank you, okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Boris. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, all. Good pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Also, thanks to Indoor people for uh, helping us in it. Pleasure, pleasure is ours, sir. Thank you very much for this uh, informative session, session sir. Thanks, really, what is the really, final score? Can you tell Indoor? Uh, definitely, sir. I'll just let you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll let you know in a bit. Okay, sir. How many countries have been watching this? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, I'm you'll sure be it's a message. well attended meeting. Looks uh, it. It is. It is. It wow. is. Great. Yeah.